we left off with Jesus being in the synagogue in Capernaum and him casting out a demon out of a, a guest who showed up at that worship service. And he was delivered by the power of God over the power of the enemy. And so what, you, what we learn here in the scripture is that Jesus has authority over all things. And in the synagogue, specifically in that situation, it's authority over the spiritual world, over holy angels and over fallen angels, demons, that um, have been allowed in some cases to torment men, torment women. We see through the Bible that there were those who were delivered uh, from demon possession. And so that stirred up the synagogue. In that synagogue, you had a few men who would become apostles who were there. Simon, Peter, and Andrew, they were brothers. James and John, also who were brothers. They lived in Capernaum. And so what's going to happen in the next scene is they're going to leave the synagogue and go into Simon Peter's house, and they're going to run into another situation. So you come out of one place where you're surprised by, by who shows up, a demon-possessed man. He deals with that, and then he steps into another situation at home in Peter's house, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's pray, and we'll dig in. Lord, thank you for being our God, as we, just, as we just sang to you, Lord, because there is no one greater than you. You are exalted above all. And that's what we're asking for this morning, to be reminded of that, for you to be exalted as we study your word, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up and all attention would be given to you. You alone are worthy, and you've called us to look to you and to trust you and to learn of you. And so we're asking for that this morning. Give us our portion by your spirit and your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 38. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. And so he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Now we're going to go a little bit further than this because that miracle that he just performed on this woman will spread throughout the city of Capernaum. And everybody's going to want a, a piece of the action of what just took place here, understandably. But um, it's interesting, again, he goes into Simon's household. So the first thing we were, were taught here is that he was very personal. He didn't just say, I only go to the synagogue, and I only preach out in the cities where everybody's at, but do not bring me into your home because I just don't want to get to know you. <laughs> As some people can be like, right? Especially when they're really popular. But he said, oh, I'll go to your house. Simon was not a full-on following apostle disciple yet. He had been exposed to the ministry of Jesus. He uh, had been baptized by John's baptism. We read that in John chapter 1. Jesus will finally call him soon after this. So he's kind of, you know, he's listening to Jesus. Remember, not everybody expected or, excuse me, accepted the Lord Jesus at this point because they're watching him, they're listening to him. Even in Nazareth, he didn't have a warm welcome from his own community that he grew up with. He was rejected. And so Capernaum is going to be his headquarters for ministry. It's like a second home to him, but they're checking him out. So he invites him into his house. Now, again, if you ever get over to Israel and you see the possible site of the synagogue in Capernaum, um, you see a lot of houses that were built around it. Everybody lived really close to each other, and oftentimes multiple family members would live with each other. So if you read the Gospel of Mark, uh, we learn that he, Simon's house was also Andrew's house. So Simon, who will be Simon Peter when his name is finally changed, his brother Andrew and their families are all living with each other. And on top of that, he has his mother-in-law. So this is a really crowded home. And they didn't have big houses like we have today. They were small. You know, the whole community knew where everybody lived. They did business with each other. And that extended out into the rest of the community. Family, uh, extra family relatives, business partners. They went to synagogue. They invited each other into their homes. As a matter of fact, a normal uh, Sabbath, 
You'd go to synagogue, and at 12 o'clock it would end, and then the rest of the day you'd go home, and you'd hang out, you'd eat with each other, you'd spend time with each other, you'd rest until sunset. And so um, a couple things to note here. Simon, who will be Simon Peter, was not the first pope. He was married because to have a mother-in-law, that means you have to have a wife. He most likely had kids, and he knew family life. And this is just so normal. The second thing you might want to note is that just because you go to synagogue or just because you go to church and you're blessed by the ministry of the Lord doesn't mean that when you go home, you're not going to have a problem. You'd think that the one who just cast out a demon, who just preached to everybody, who's the Christ, when he comes to your house, every problem's going to be gone. Sometimes it's the opposite. Right after a great service, he comes home and there's a fiery, burning trial, and his mother-in-law is the one who was struck with a, Luke notes, high fever. He's the only one who mentions the intensity of the fever. And no doubt, Peter cared about his mother-in-law. He was concerned about this. Maybe she woke up in the morning, you know, getting everything uh, just getting ready to go to synagogue, and she is struck with a fever. You know what that's like. Most of us have had this happen to us. You're just out of nowhere. You just start getting sick, and you're under the blankets, and you're cold, and you're sweating, and you are miserable. And, and some fevers can end up taking your life, leaving you permanently damaged. And they didn't have the medical care that we have today. So this is a serious concern. She's not just down with a little bit of a cold and she's okay, but she has a high fever. And so they make a request of Christ. And what he does, it says in verse 39, is he stood over her. Now that was what a doctor would do back then. They would stand over their position, over their patient. And so what he's demonstrating here is that he is ultimately what he called himself the great physician. He stands over her. He rebukes the fever. It's the same word used for rebuking the devil and also rebuking the wind and the waves when that storm arose, and it left her. And notice, immediately she stood up and began to serve them. And so a couple things to, to point out here about that miracle, that um, he has authority over all sickness, everything. And when he speaks... That's enough. So he could do a miracle by speaking. He could do a miracle by touching. Sometimes he does both to teach a lesson here. But regardless, this woman didn't have to slowly get out of bed because the fever broke. Again, you might know what that's like. You have the flu or something like that. I got hit with that after Christmas week. Happens to me every, every Christmas. Merry Christmas. Go to bed, you're sick. Oh, great. But maybe a day or two later, you're still kind of slow right around the house. It's hard to even just do little things. You have to recover. That's normal healing. She stood up immediately. There's no exhaustion. And the response was to serve. That the master's word, the master's touch in her life gave an immediate healing. And the immediate response was, I want to go help people. So the overflow of his miraculous power in her life was service in her life. And so, of course, word spreads. Look at verse 40. When the sun was setting, so this is the end of Sabbath, all those who had, note, any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. And so, of course, this makes sense. You see the miracle? She was gravely ill with this fever. He just touched her. He spoke to her. He rebuked it. She's up. She's serving. I got to go tell somebody. So that night, Mark says the whole city showed up. How many people showed up at Peter's house? He's trying to have a nice Sabbath off. He hasn't even committed himself to ministry yet, but God's showing him something. You want to follow Christ? Get ready for action. All these people are at the door. I'll get it. The whole city. Hi, I got a demon-possessed guy over here. 
Oh, this is my brother over here who's paralyzed. This one over here is sick. This one. And I don't know if Peter said, hey, look, you're just going to have to go home for a while here. I got to get ready for tomorrow. Jesus, I'm improvising here, but Jesus ministered to every one of them. Every problem that was brought to him, he healed. Everybody who had been possessed by an evil spirit, we don't know how many, were delivered. It was all complete healing. It was all immediate. It was total deliverance. There were no questions asked. G. Campbell Morgan said about this passage that there were no conditions to his healing in these people, except for this, you had a need. That was it. There was no confusion about what was going on. There were no offerings. No faith requirements, nothing. He, they brought people, and every one of them was ministered to by the power of God. And then in verse 42, it says, Now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. And so this just makes common sense to people, right? Well, we want to know where he is who can work these miracles. What was his response to everything here, right? Let's say there's 1,000 people. Let's say there's 2,000 people coming to, to this area of where Peter lived, and he's ministering to him. And the power of God is going forth, and people are getting healed. Most people will say, I'm staying right here. This is effective ministry. Let's do more. I mean, this is really popular. This is exciting. People are getting ministered to, but he leaves. Mark says that he rose up long before it was day to go pray. So when sundown hits, he's healing and ministering to everybody. At some point, he gets a break, sleeps, how long? Two hours? Three hours? gets up long before it was daylight and goes and seeks God. Because as the God-man, he knew that his place of communion with the Father was vital. Because remember, he didn't do anything except the Father spoke to him to do it, and the power of the Father worked through him. It was more important for him to be in communion with God so that he can minister effectively to the people, not just be a crowd pleaser, or a man of the people. He was the man of God who was ministering to the people. And in verses 43, after they tried to keep him, his response to them was this, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. So they try to hold on to him, and his response was this, I can't just stay here. I've been called by God, sent by the Father to preach to other cities. Preach what? Preach the kingdom of God. Now, when you look at a passage like this, there's a lot of questions that, that you'll probably have, that I have, when you work through this, this part of Scripture, which is focused in on a couple of things. The reality of somebody who was connected to a godly man, and we could assume that Simon's mother-in-law at some point would come to faith, hopefully. But then she was sick. These things happen. Just because you're called to be an apostle, just because you're a Christian, doesn't mean that you or someone that you love won't experience some type of illness. <coughs> and what about the ministry of Christ and healing? Because there's a lot of opinions on healing, about faith and deliverance. And there's doctrines about, you know, well, does God heal you if you're a Christian? Should you ever experience sickness? Uh, what about healing services? What about uh, healing ministries? A person just says, I'm, I'm, I have this healing ministry, and I go around the world, and I heal people. God's given that to me. Can we trust it? What does it all mean? Uh, well, what does it actually look like when somebody is really touched by the Lord and that infirmity, that, that illness, that disability, or whatever it is, is really ministered to? So hopefully we'll have some of those questions answered this morning. The first thing to, to note is that uh, 
to think about this. God doesn't want us to have confusion. Because sometimes we have questions, we have requests, and because of different teachings that are out there, a lot of Christians end up really confused about the issue. Well, you know, I, I believe, I love the Lord, I've prayed, I've asked, and for myself, and I still have this disability, or I still have this sickness, or my husband does, or my wife does, or my child, or my friend, or whatever it is, and it seems like God doesn't do that anymore, or he hasn't answered my prayer. Where, is there something wrong? Because you can feel like you don't have enough faith. You can believe that God has rejected you, feel condemned, confused by the whole issue. Uh, what, what does it actually look like? Again, what if I pray and I'm not completely healed, right? Well, does God partially heal? Or does he heal fully and completely? How long does it take? What's the difference between normal healing and supernatural healing in your body? It goes on all the time. We just may not think about it like that. Well, the first thing you note from this passage is that when he heals and he is able to heal, he does it by a word. Sometimes he would use his hands and he was teaching them something with that. He felt like he had to grab somebody and the power had to go through his hand into somebody. More often than not, he was using that as an illustration to somebody to teach him something more about himself. But he just used a word. And when he did it, it was instant. Every symptom was immediately healed. And there was nothing left of that symptom that was unhealed. And so the first thing to note, a genuine healing miracle will be complete and it will be instant. Secondly, they were clearly defined diseases here. In other words, these sicknesses were known. Now it says in, in, uh, chat, in verse 40 that there were various diseases. But there were people who were real lepers throughout the scripture, they knew exactly what it was. It wasn't confusion about the leprosy. It was a real disease that had marred their entire body. There was real blindness, like they couldn't see. There was real hemorrhaging, real deafness, real paralysis. People who were dead and raised to life, they were really dead. They knew they were dead. The widow of Nain's son was dead, already in a casket being brought to his burial. Jairus' daughter, even though she wasn't dead long, they knew she was dead because when Jesus showed up and said she's sleeping, of course he was speaking metaphorically, they mocked him. They knew what death looked like. Then, of course, Lazarus was dead for four days. These miracles were without question. The diseases that he healed were very clear. They weren't vague and ambiguous. He healed people who believed, and he healed people who didn't believe. As a matter of fact, he sent the apostles out with the same kingdom, power, and authority to heal people. We see that in Luke chapter 9. Let me read a couple passages out of the book of Acts, because it continued. Under the ministry of Philip, it said that those who were in Samaria gave heed to Philip, Because unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and that were lame were healed. There's no question about it. In Acts chapter 14, when Paul saw a man in Lystra, it says he was impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. He heard Paul speaking. He looked at Paul. Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed, and he said with a loud voice, stand up right on your feet. He leaped and walked, and when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, and they called him a god. Now, they got that part wrong, but you get the point. They knew that it was an absolute miracle because that person couldn't walk. When Paul went to um, the island uh, of Malta, an unbeliever, the father of Publius, who was sick of a fever and dysentery, a very specific sickness and disease, Paul went into him, prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. Now note this. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So when you go through the scripture, the people who 
believed who were healed, they were healed of identifiable diseases. Those who were unbelievers, who had maybe become a believer because of it, were healed of identifiable diseases. And it wasn't always dependent on that person's faith. There were times where, like in the case of Paul, where he saw somebody, he could tell the person had faith to be healed. And there was something going on there between that person and God. But there were other people who obviously didn't have faith to be healed because they were dead. Like Eutychus, who fell out of a loft. He was dead. God raised him. Again, Lazarus, he was dead. God raised, God raised him. Dorcas, she was dead. God raised her from the dead. So there was no question or confusion about it. Even the people who were his enemies, Jesus' enemies, knew that they were real miracles. If you read John chapter 5 with the man who was by uh, the, that spring um, who was there for his whole life, when he was healed, it wasn't whether he was healed or not, it was that Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. And again, in John chapter 9, healing a blind man on the Sabbath. The issue wasn't whether he was blind. When they found out that he was, they knew he was. It was that he did it on the Sabbath. And with Lazarus, they knew he was dead. It was a threat to their power and authority. So the miracles were without question. And so it's important to understand that, that a real healing would be without question. There'd be no confusion because today, and there's always been phonies out there who will claim to be some type of a healer for ratings, for power over people, or for money. You want to boil it down to that. There's people who make money off of ministry. Now, that doesn't mean that we should throw out the fact that God healed and that he can still do that today if he so pleases. God can heal. And if he does so, he does so as he determines to do so, so through the prayers of his church. Not always, and not just because we have enough faith to do it, or not, it's because he's so determined to do so. This is serious because there's a lot of people who really do get confused about the issue, about God's will, about God's characters on the line here. There are people who feel con condemned because they've been sick for years, and they haven't experienced this passage right here. They haven't seen thousands of people getting healed all at once. And so they may think, well, what's wrong with me? Have I disappointed God? Have I done something in my life that would bring his chastisement? And that's why I'm sick. I've prayed, and this disease wasn't taken away from my family member or my friend or myself. What's happening here? Well, a couple of things need to be understood. It's significant, first of all, that he actually touched them to heal them. That wasn't the norm back then. If, if a rabbi would pray for somebody, they wouldn't lay their hands on them for healing. Jesus is doing this intentionally to let them know that this is personal. This isn't an impersonal force that could be conjured up by somebody else and used at their own discretion for healing. Or this didn't just happen by chance. In other words, he's saying, I am personally choosing to lay my hand upon you and it's through my word that you're being healed. He knew every one of the people that would come to that house that night. He knew Simon. He knew Simon's mother-in-law. He knew the thousands that would come to Peter's door and all those that he would minister to afterwards. He knew them personally. For somebody now to claim the gift of healing, but they really don't have that, will mislead other people. It's going to lead to confusion, disappointment, Again, condemnation, in some cases, unbelief, because there's been deception involved. Only God can ultimately heal, and he does that according to his own will, not according to the will of a man. As if somebody can summon up the power of God whenever they want to. This oftentimes leads to theological cults, where people get confused. They, get, they start going after the healing instead of the healer. That doesn't mean that God doesn't heal, because he can. As a matter of fact, in your body every day, if you experience something like a cold, and your body recovers from that, even if you're using medicine, um, 
eventually your body will, in, in a normal case, heal itself. God's put that into your body. We just, it's so normal to us that we don't think about that as healing. Uh, but it is. So if you think about it like this, if you were to go outside and you had a scratch in your car, right, and then like a week later that scratch was gone and the paint covered it and the car healed itself, you'd be like, wow, that's a miracle. That's incredible. I didn't have to take it to the auto body shop. It's healed. Well, that's what happens in our bodies all the time. That's just normal. But in, in the scripture, and this does, I still believe, does happen where God overrides the normal healing that he accomplishes all the time in our lives. He can override that and do something supernaturally. Not only to show you that he's real, because oftentimes he'll do that on the mission field to show an unbeliever that he really is God. You talk to missionaries on the out out in different parts of the world where they're steeped in idolatry and witchcraft and demonic activity to talk about demons being cast out, people being healed. Some might be questioned, but there's many legitimate stories, even in our country. It's not the norm, but it does happen. So we need to be reminded that there are phonies who capitalize on scripture for themselves, for their own purposes, for their own ratings, and again, oftentimes they get into people's pockets. Some people are just taught these things from, from youth that come from churches where they don't believe you should see a doctor. Because if you really have faith, God will just heal you. And if he doesn't heal you, then there's something wrong with you. You've obviously sinned against God. And they grow up thinking these things. I mean, it's very important to have a very clear understanding from the scripture of the character and nature of God when and why he healed then and why he would or wouldn't do that today. Oftentimes, the, the nature of a human being is to go after the supernatural. We get attracted to that, right? But the danger is that we would be more inclined to take what Alexander McLaren called the smaller gifts at the hand of God instead of the greater gifts. This is exactly what he said. He said, if you offer men the smaller gifts, they'll run over one another in their scramble for them. What are the smaller gifts he's talking about? Well, I've got to say this carefully, but like healing. That's a gift of God. But in comparison to salvation, it's a smaller gift. Offer them the highest, salvation, they'll scarcely hold out a slow hand to take it. Remember, these crowds that showed up at Simon's house were all about getting healed. And I don't fault them for that because if I had somebody, or if it was me, if I had a terminal disease, if, I, if it was me or my family member, I'd probably show up at his house too. Especially if I knew it was Jesus really doing it. It wasn't some phony baloney guy out there just trying to put on a show. So you understand that. When you're desperate, you may go to try and find help. But we have to be careful because it's not always God. In this case, it was, but Jesus didn't always heal everybody. There were times where he saw multitudes of people. Like in John chapter 5, he went to one guy. Multitudes of people were at that place waiting for the water to be moved. He picked one, and then he disappeared. Because sometimes we can think that's the greater thing, the sensational, the miracle power. Well, there were those who were healed by Christ and didn't follow him. As a matter of fact, later on in his ministry, he would severely judge Capernaum because so much was done in them, yet they didn't receive the gospel. They didn't receive him. Remember the 10 lepers that were healed? One came back. Jesus' question was, where are the other nine? They took the healing. He blessed them. He cared for them. He gave that to them. But as far as we know, after that, they never returned. 
See, he understands that. And that's why after everything was going on, and we need to remember this, he cared for them. He wanted to minister to them. He was able to do that. He blessed them. He had compassion on them. But he also knew that what was more important was the kingdom of God being preached, the kingdom of God being established. In his own friendship with Lazarus, he let him die. That really troubled some of his closest companions. Confused Thomas. The other disciples didn't know what was going on. Mary and Martha were both like, Why, what, what's the deal, Lord? But it was for a greater glory that he let Lazarus die. We all know the end of that story. There's a greater glory that God has in store for all of us. A greater purpose, a permanent kingdom that has to be established. Every one of those people that he ministered to, as great as the miracle was, all died. Every one of them. The blind would see the grave. The deaf, after they had their hearing again, would see the grave. Those who were paralyzed, though they'd walk and jumped, leaped for joy, would see the grave. Lazarus, who was raised, this is great, would die again. This is not great. <laughs> but I, I think the next time he died, as he was passing, think, I got this. Because I know what happens afterwards. Jesus said, I must, look at verse 43, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. First of all, it's not just you guys. I got other work to do. I know you want me to stay here, but you don't understand that the kingdom of God has to be preached. What was and what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the supremacy of God and his rule through the universe, but not just in healing people, not just in recovering sight to the blind. All these things were prophesied in the book of Isaiah. In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Yes, people would get their physical hearing back. They get their physical sight back. That took place in the days of Jesus. So when people saw it, they're like, wait, that, that's him. He's able to do this. Nobody was able to just speak a word or touch somebody at will and heal somebody. Nobody made people walk, especially with the multitudes and the multitudes that he healed. If you read John 21, he had said and done so much more than what's written in here that John said, if it was all written down, he said, I suppose that the whole world can contain the books. I don't know, but we have enough here. It's enough here. But it was to show people this is Christ. It was also to show people that the future, the future when Christ rules on earth, this will be the norm. There will be no more blindness. There will be no more deafness. There will be no more paralysis. There will be no more sickness. You're never going to have a cold, the flu. You're never going to experience death again. That will be the norm. What's normal right now will be abnormal then. Eternal life, eternal joy, eternal pleasures at the right hand of God. That is a great future that we have ahead of us. So no matter what's going on right now, the future is very bright for the Christian. That is the kingdom of God. That is when he rules supreme. But that's the future. But that's through redemption. That doesn't happen unless we're redeemed first. And he knew that. And even though they didn't understand that, they're looking at the smaller gifts. They're good. And listen, we should ask for these things. We'll close in a minute with this, what we should be asking for. But they, they're, they're focused on the temporary. He's saying, okay, but wait a second. If I don't establish the kingdom of God the right way for you, you'll be lost eternally. All these things are temporary. They're fading. The healing's great. The health is great. But if you die in your sin, you'll be lost. He's preaching the kingdom of God. Look, 
The emphasis in his ministry was preaching, not doing miracles. He didn't come to be a miracle worker just to do that and then to take off and impress people. He came to preach. Preach what? The kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? The rule of Christ over the universe through redemption. In other words, men can be saved, redeemed by this Messiah so that we can be with him forever, so that he has that proper place in our lives. Now, here, on earth, in the present, within us. And that will transfer into eternity when we're with him. For us to go there and to experience eternal life, where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, none of that, the kingdom of God has to be within us first. And for that to happen, he knew that he had to go do the Father's will. So when he went away from everybody, he would get alone, he would pray. And whatever was going on between him and the Father, it was thy will be done every day. Father, thy will be done. Where do you want me to go today? Okay, I'm going to go there. Oh, I have to go through Samaria? I'm going to go through Samaria. I have to go to Jerusalem? I have to go to Jerusalem. Guys, we're going to Jerusalem, but they're going to kill you. I have to go to Jerusalem. He had to go there at the end of his ministry. He had to go to the cross. He had to go to the cross so that our sins would be forgiven. He'd make the payment for our sins. So he'd make us right with God so that God can dwell in us, the kingdom of God, the rule of Christ, taking up the throne in our hearts here. I must preach the kingdom of God so that you can be in the kingdom of God. All this is great, but it's passing. It's temporary. He was showing them. This is what you can look ahead to when you can sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the saints that have gone before. And every believer who will be there, it's going to happen, guys. But until then, I have to make atonement for your sins so that you can be there. So that God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit can dwell in us and we can have fellowship with him so that when you die, when I die, and we will, it's not if, it's when, we'll be in the kingdom of God. See, that was the more important part of his ministry that he was teaching them. That gives perspective for everything. What happens if we're sick? Let me look at the pastors like this. What should we do if we're sick? We should pray. We should pray. We're told in the scripture to pray. James said to this, listen, he said, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. So this is something that is biblical anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. The fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, of course, in context, he's not saying everybody that's prayed for is going to experience healing. That doesn't mean that. But, but we're commanded to pray. And as God wills and he desires, so he does. He heals, he touches. We have to give that to God. But we're to ask should you see a doctor? Depends on which one. I think it takes faith to go to a doctor. I go. But remember, they're just practicing. It is their practice. <laughs> so you go. You do your best with it. Hey, hey, in all seriousness, I'm so thankful to live in the 21st century. You don't always get great help. You have, there's a choice out there. right? And, and, you, and, and you and I should... Take advantage of that. God in his wisdom and his mercy has given us great information, technology today to deal with things that we couldn't deal with 100 years ago, 50 years ago. But Jesus said those who are sick need a physician. But pray and ask. Peter did the right thing. He's a great example to us. He brought his concern to Christ. We should always bring our concerns to Christ. Peter was a great example to us. He loved his mother-in-law. Need I say more? But in all seriousness, 
He cared for this person in his life. He loved her. And it wasn't just him. They were all concerned. We should care for each other. And if somebody is sick, if somebody is in pain, if somebody is suffering, pray. Knowing that God hears. Knowing that he cares. And knowing that he'll answer. Now, it may not always be yes. We need to be resolved to yield to the Lord no matter what his desire is and say, your will be done. Because that's more important than anything. He cares most of all that we're his. That we're his redeemed. That whatever choice he has in our life, whether he touches our lives and he removes that suffering or he allows it in our lives to test us, to make our faith stronger, that we're his, that we're a part of his kingdom, that it's within us, that it's real within us. That our lives are obedient to him. That like Jesus, we're submitted to the will of the Father. He taught us what to pray. Thy kingdom come. We should pray that. Lord, bring your kingdom. Let your kingdom come. Let that be your desire. But he also said, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Can we pray that? Can we say that in truth? That's the most important thing with God. We can surrender and leave everything to his will and trust him.